Yes, hello everybody. Welcome uh, to uh, this meeting with uh, economist Dan Mitchell from the American think tank Cato Institute. We have been looking forward uh, to this meeting. Uh, Dan Mitchell is a leading expert on tax reform and supply side tax policy. Dan holds a master's degree in e e economics from the University of Georgia and a PhD in uh, economics from George Mason University. Prior to joining Cato, Dan was a senior fellow with the Heritage Foundation, another leading American think tank, and an economist for Senator Bob Packwood and the Senate Finance Committee. Dan Mitchell is, a, is an influential economist in the American political debate. Today, among other things, he will talk about the Obama presidency, the debate about Obamacare, spending policy, tax, and minimum wage. And he will also compare it to the Bush presidency. He will also talk about challenges for welfare states like Denmark and the globalization. Dan will talk for about 45 minutes, and uh, after for afterwards, he will take on questions. Thank you again, Dan. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mads. Uh, I have one correction to the introduction. I if I was an influential US economist, we wouldn't have such bad policy in Washington. <laughs> so so I, I try to, uh, to make things better in Washington, but I, I've been failing for many, many years. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I have a PowerPoint presentation, and so it's very easy for me to keep on track with what I'm saying. So even though I'm supposed to talk and then take questions, if there's something that you, you're really excited about, or you think I'm an idiot and you want to raise your hand and tell me, you know, just raise your hand. We can sort of go over it and then continue with the presentation. So, so don't feel like you have to wait until the very end. We don't have to be like the Swiss and be very obedient. We can be a little bit like the Italians or Greeks, and not in fiscal policy, but in terms of, in terms of not obeying the rules. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump right into the presentation. I've sort of broken it up into a couple of different categories. Uh, probably I should start with Obama's economic performance. Uh, because this is something that I don't think people really understand, not only in America, but especially around the world. We're in the fifth year of an economic recovery in the U.S. The recession technically ended in the summer of 2009, but 57% of the population, according to a poll that just came out last week, thinks we're still in a recession. Why? Well, the explanation is that we have a very, very weak recovery. I mean, it matters. It matters whether you have a, a normal strong recovery where you have a couple of years of four or five percent growth or whether you're just sort of slowly climbing out of the ditch. It, it makes a huge difference in terms of people's expectations, their experiences, whether they think things are going in the right direction. And we especially have very bad employment numbers and income numbers. And let's look at some charts uh, that I took from different sources. This is from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank's website. They have a very interesting, at least if you're a boring economist, a very interesting interactive feature where you can click all these little boxes and compare different recessions and recoveries uh, since the end of World War II. And I look uh, not at recessions, but at recoveries because that's something that presumably is under Obama's control. The recovery began in the summer of 2009 after he was already president for six months, several months after his so-called stimulus was enacted. Now, all you really need to understand about this chart, lots of different business cycles since the end of World War II, the red line is Obama. The second weakest, this is employment data, second weakest job recovery since the end of World War II. Uh, way, way behind, behind, uh, behind the average. I mean, th this is what you normally get, the, the clump of lines on the left side. That's what a normal recovery looks like uh, with the economy picking up steam and recovering all the lost output and all the lost jobs. But instead, look where we are. And by the way, if I showed this same chart, but I showed it from the beginning of the business cycle, you would see that we're still not back to the number of jobs we had back in 2007. Uh, so this is a terrible, 
uh, uh, recovery uh, from a recession. Now let's look at the GDP, the economic growth, the output numbers, and we see this. Oh no, did I, I put employment for both? Well, that just shows how uninfluential I am in Washington. Uh, well, well, if, let's assume, economists are really great at assuming things, let's assume this was a chart of GDP numbers. Uh, what you would find, what you would find is that the red line would actually, and actually, you can go to my blog and see that I actually did do it right on my blog. I just, when I was copying the charts, I obviously screwed up. But you would see that the red line for Obama it is the weakest GDP recovery since the end of World War II. Uh, now that's a pretty damning indictment, uh, as, especially since you know, there's, no, there's no structural reason uh, why we should expect that. But you know, very weak uh, employment numbers, very weak GDP numbers, which again, we're imagining that we're seeing right here. Uh, let's look at a chart that I didn't make a mistake on. Th these are the median household income numbers from the Census Bureau. Now, some people say that you should use 2008 as your base year. Some people say 2009. It doesn't matter. Whether you, whatever year you use as a base year, look at where we are in the last available numbers from the Census Bureau. Uh, if, if there's a recovery, it hasn't shown up in the median household income numbers. As a matter of fact, if you break down those numbers, and you look at the different income groups, you know, the bottom 20%, second 20%, the middle 20%, top 20%, top 5%, top 1%. The only group that is actually enjoying more income during the Obama years is the top 1%. Think about that. Obama loves to talk about, oh, we're gonna go after those top 1%, those rich fat cats, we're gonna tax them. They're the only ones who are doing well in the Obama economy. Why? Well, in all likelihood, it's because of all our easy money policy, the QE policies, you know, the, the Federal Reserve is pumping money into the, uh, into the financial markets. It's bidding up asset prices on Wall Street and the top 1% is doing okay. But, but easy money policy, for those of you who follow monetary policy, it's like uh, you know, trying to push on a string. You know, you're, you're not gonna do anything to the real economy. Instead, you're just adding liquidity, which of course is how we got into this trouble in the first place, because the recession, the financial crisis from last decade, what was it? It was easy money policy from the Fed. So you had all this extra liquidity sloshing around in the economy. And then the federal government took these two entities that were created by Congress, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We tilted the playing field. So all that extra liquidity was sloshing into the housing market. We had a housing bubble and guess what? It happens to bubbles all the time. They eventually burst. And now we very well could be in a, in a financial market bubble because the Fed, not only the Fed, the European Central Bank has also been guilty of this. Uh, politicians all around the world are thinking, well, let's try to make up for the weak economy by just printing more money, figuratively speaking. They don't actually print the money. Instead, they create the money by buying uh, bonds and things like that. But the median household income numbers are very, very grim, although they're exaggerated. They're exaggerated because median household income numbers don't account for things like the changing size of households. They don't count a lot of non-cash income and things like that. So, so the U.S. isn't actually doing this bad, but there's no question that it's a very, very weak performance that we're seeing uh, during the Obama years. Now here's a chart that I think is really, really depressing. It shows the employment population ratio. Now let's stop for a second and have a little economics lesson. I promise it won't be too painful. Every economic theory, every economic theory, even Marxism, even socialism, they all agree that there are two factors of production, labor and capital. I mean, what else is there? Some people say entrepreneurship, but entrepreneurship is either labor, just a specialized form of it, or you could say it's human capital, but whatever. It's, it's one of those two categories. So if your two factors of production are labor and capital, what happens when all of a sudden instead of having about 63% of your adult population employed, all of a sudden you're down at around 58.5%. 5% of your employable population has seemingly permanently left the labor force. Now, it used to be with recessions, we'd get the you know, up, down, up, down, up, down. No, this is down and staying down. And there doesn't seem to be any indication that that number is improving. It seems to be 58.5, 58.6 every month, month in, month out. Why? Well, all sorts of possible reasons. How about the fact that the government is paying people to be unemployed? 
How about the fact that the government has disability programs that allow people to claim, oh, I have a bad back, I can't work anymore, so give me a check for the rest of my life. And the eligibility rules have been very loosened. So whether it's long-term unemployment benefits, whether it's disability rules, uh, a lot of people have just decided it's a weak economy, I can't find a job, so I'm just gonna check out and live off the government for the rest of my life. But what does that do for the rest of us? It means all this potential output from this labor has disappeared from our economy. And if it stays that way, uh, if there's no recovery, that's a very, very grim sign for long-run economic growth in the US. And then here's one last chart about the Obama economy. Um, I probably shouldn't have entitled it this since I'm speaking in Europe, but it's the Europeanization of long-run unemployment. This is the OECD average of the, peop of, the, of the total number of unemployed, what percent of them have been unemployed for 12 months or more. And in Europe, it's always been relatively high, averaging about 30%. In the US, it's always been very low, averaging about 10%. Well, guess what? Obama wanted to make America more like Europe. He succeeded. I mean, let's give him some applause. He actually did something that he said he wanted to do. The problem is, I think making America more like Europe is the wrong approach. We should be trying to make America more like Hong Kong. Or if we're going to be more like Europe, let's at least try to be like Switzerland, uh, where they, where they uh, do score better on the economic freedom of the world index and have a smaller burden of government. So this will give you a sense of where our economy is under Obama. Now, let's point out that this is a bipartisan problem. Mad said I was gonna talk about Bush. This is really all I wanna say. We had an American president who expanded the burden of spending, increased regulation, made the tax code more complex, and added a new healthcare entitlement. But it wasn't Obama, well actually it was Obama, but it was also Bush because Bush did exactly the same thing. Sometimes with American audiences, I, I, I trick them. I do a little quiz where I sort, of, I sort of have all these things with like a little box you could tick off and say, okay, Here's a president who did this, and did this, and did this, and did this. Who was it? And everyone raises their hand. It was Obama. It was Obama. And I say, well, you're sort of right, but who else was it? It was Bush. Uh, Obama, what was really ironic, is Obama in 2008 ran saying he wanted hope and change. And he did exactly, not exactly, of course, but, but uh, probably an 85 to 90% overlap in terms of the same economic policies. Only Obama did them on purpose. Bush sort of did them... I'm not even gonna speculate why he did them, but uh, uh, everyone, everyone can draw their own conclusions. But, but the good thing about working at a libertarian think tank is I don't have to play party favors. I don't have to say, oh, well, he's a Republican, I have to say good things, or he's a Democrat, I have to say bad things. My job at the Cato Institute is to simply give an honest assessment of whether or not a politician, regardless of party, is increasing or reducing the overall burden of government. And if you, and if you look at the policies we've gotten under both Bush and Obama, the 21st century has not been the American century. I don't know whose century it's going to be, uh, but so far it's not the American century. And you see this, by the way, you don't have to believe me. Go to the Economic Freedom of the World, published by the Fraser Institute in Canada, and they do these you know, rankings, and of course Hong Kong and Singapore are usually one and two. I think like Venezuela and you know, Myanmar, or whatever people used to call it, Burma, you know, those are the countries way down at the bottom. But the US, if you go back to the end of the Clinton years, you go back to the end of the Clinton years, the US, I think, was as high as number three. Now we're down to number 17. We're behind Denmark. I mean, it, it, and why is that? Well, you guys have a big welfare state, but you get a very good score in almost every other category. Rule of law, property rights, monetary policy, trade policy, regulatory policy. Your welfare state's a bit of a problem, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But in other areas, there's a lot to emulate about uh, what Denmark's doing. But I want to go ahead and say some good news about what's happening in the U.S. in terms of economic policy, because maybe the bad news of the 21st century is coming to a close. Uh, why do I say that? Because the burden of government spending isn't climbing as fast. Obamacare is unraveling. And the amazing thing is, Obama's doing the unraveling. Uh, I mean, you know, I was talking about the economic freedom of the world, and I was saying you know, one of the categories is rule of law and property rights. What's rule of law? Well, it actually encompasses several things, but it means that when you have the law, the government enforces the law and doesn't arbitrarily uh, ignore whatever is inconvenient. But what has Obama done with Obamacare? On something like 19 different occasions, he has unilaterally said, it doesn't matter that the law says this will happen on January 1st, 2014, it's not happening. 
He's done that 19 times, oftentimes with major provisions of the law. That's the sort of thing they do in Zimbabwe and Argentina, but now we do it in the US. And I have to confess, I don't know whether to be happy or sad because I don't want Obamacare implemented. Uh, it's a bad law. It's increasing government. And we already had a very heavily government controlled and directed uh, health care system before Obamacare. And Obama just added another layer of government on top of all the other layers of government. So it's bad news. So am I happy that he's violating the rule of law and making us a banana republic? Or am I? You know, I, I just don't know. So I. I but anyhow, the point is, it's unraveling. It's very unpopular. Uh, one very, I don't know if it's a safe prediction to make, uh, but as of right now, it's quite likely that the Democrats will lose the Senate in the 2014 elections. They already lost the House in 2010 because of Obamacare, and now it looks like they're gonna lose the Senate in, uh, in 2014. So Obama has achieved something that I thought was impossible, after all the corrupt big spending of the Bush years, I thought Republicans were going to be in the minority for a long time. Uh, but Obama, I mean, the, the Republican National Committee is probably going to name him Man of the Year. Uh, so anyhow, so government spending isn't growing as fast. Obamacare is sort of self-destructing before our eyes. And then here's what actually makes me optimistic. I don't often get optimistic talking about government policy because as Thomas Jefferson said, the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and liberty to yield ground. But I think there's widespread recognition that we need genuine entitlement reform. And what, by that I mean you know, the, the so-called mandatory programs in the United States. First and foremost, it's all the health care entitlements. Medicaid, Medicare, Obamacare. Medicare is our government-run health program for old people. Medicaid is the government-run health care program for, for poor people, and of course Obamacare is basically a turbocharged version of Medicaid. Uh, but people realize we need to do something. Why? Because policymakers have seen what's happened in Europe. And they sort of in the back of their minds that, you know, for, for decades they've been told, you know, by the Social Security Trustees Report, by the Medicare Trustees Reports, by the long-run projections from, from the Congressional Budget Office, the Government Accountability Office. Uh, everyone's been telling them, we have a serious long-run problem. Entitlements, dem demography, aging population. And politicians, yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever, shut up. Uh, give me a campaign check, leave me alone. Uh, but now, with what's happened in Europe, I think they realize something has to be done. Moreover, at the end of the day, are politicians going to do the right thing without the public behind them? Probably not. So it's very good news that there's a lot of polling data out there uh, that the American people see government as the problem. Uh, there, there's a famous American uh, political writer, uh, Mark Stein, who said that the difference during the financial fiscal crisis at the end of last decade, the difference between America and the rest of the world slight exaggeration, but you'll get the point, was that in the rest of the world, people went out in the streets to protest for more government. In America, with the Tea Party, they went out on the streets to protest for less government. Uh, so maybe, maybe we're seeing a classical liberal renaissance. And we'll look at some numbers here. This is annual federal government spending. Federal government means our central government in Washington. We have a federal system, so there's spending at the state and local level as well. Well, during the Clinton years, we actually had spending restraint. Clinton, a Democrat, was actually our second most free market president since the end of World War II. I never thought I'd be thinking, oh, bring back Bill Clinton, please, please. Uh, but not only did we get good Monica Lewinsky jokes, we actually got some good government <laughs> policy. But unfortunately, then we had the Bush-Obama era of profligacy. This is the no bureaucrat left behind education bill, the corrupt farm bills, the pork filled transportation bills, uh, the prescription drug entitlement, the TARP bailout, the, the fake stimulus. And so we had like 10 years of just big government run amok. It was like, the, it was like Francois Hollande had been teleported into Washington and was directing government policy. But then something happened. The Tea Party got elected. And in 2012 and 2013, for the first time since the 1950s, we actually had two consecutive years of government spending less one year after the other. Amazing, two years in a row where government actually spent less. This is, what makes this interesting is because in Washington, normally they have this very funny definition of spending cut. Oh, we increased spending by 6% instead of 8%, therefore that's a 2% cut. I mean, 
It's, it's sort of like, you know, if your wife goes to the store and comes back, honey, I, I saved a thousand kroner. Well, how, how'd you do that? Well, I got something on sale. Instead of being 3,000, it was only 2,000. I, I don't want to be sexist. It's, 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 it's like if, if your husband comes back from the hardware store and he says, oh, honey, I saved all this money. I bought this riding lawnmower on sale. That's literally, I'm not joking, that is how they budget in Washington. Uh, so year after year, we supposedly get spending cuts, but government grows and grows and grows because they have this very dishonest way of doing it. But we actually got real spending cuts. That's an amazing bit of progress uh, considering the horrible path we were on uh, during the Bush-Obama uh, spending binge. Uh, now here's some interesting numbers, because I want to point out it's, it's, you know, Obama is not the worst, especially without last two years of data. Uh, this is primary spending minus bailouts. What's primary spending? It's government spending, not counting interest payments. So if you want to measure what a politician is doing in their term of office, you know, the interest payment is, is the amount you have to pay on the debt run up by previous politicians. So I think to be fair, you want to take interest payments out of the equation. But I also think you want to take bailouts out of the equation. Uh, because the way bailouts work in Washington, you have a spike in spending when they do a bailout, but then when the money is paid back, it counts as negative spending. So, so your numbers are all screwed up. So what I did to get a sort of accurate measure of, of the underlying spending trends of different administrations, I looked at primary spending minus bailouts. Who was the worst president in the last, what, what I guess is going back you know, 40, 50 years? LBJ. 6% real, in other words, inflation-adjusted spending increases. But look at the two Bushes, Republicans. They were way down near the bottom too. Obama's sort of in the middle, uh, and Reagan and Clinton were the best. Now, of course, you know, when I put this on my blog, I actually had about five or six of these charts because, you know, Clinton and Nixon, uh, Clinton benefited from the peace dividend. Nixon benefited from the drawdown in Vietnam. Of course, LBJ had the buildup in Vietnam. You know, so there's a lot of, you know, mixed up numbers here. And if you look just at domestic spending, you know, Reagan is way ahead of everyone else uh, and Obama falls down a bit. But of course, the two Bushes stay way down as well. It doesn't matter whether you have an R after your name or a D after your name. Republican Republican or Democrat, if you're increasing the burden of government, that's not going to be good uh, for the economy. Now here's the chart that really warms my heart. This is a, a Gallup poll, and it asks people, what's the biggest threat to the country in the future? Big business, big labor, or big government? 72% say big government. Uh, there's also polling data out there uh, saying that the federal government is a threat to the future of the country and a threat to people's liberties. Uh, so, so I think there is this, this growing sentiment that Washington is too big, it's out of control, you know, whether it's NSA spying or whether it's wasteful spending, whether it's corrupt crony capitalism. Uh, Washington is just a cesspool uh, of, a, of, a, of bad things happening. So now let's sort of broaden out from America and look at the West, the Western world. Uh, supposedly the, the, the best part of the world in terms of uh, growth. Uh, w what can we say? Well, every so often, you know, in other nations, but in the U.S., you get a market-oriented leader and you move things in the right direction a little bit. Uh, but it's it, it sort of, it's, I don't know, you, it's like in a harbor where tugboats, they sort of nudge a big boat, but they're not really causing dramatic changes. They sort of just you know, push it a little bit one way, and then the next day someone pushes it another. It seems like we're just sort of on this underlying trend in the wrong direction. Uh, and, and so you get a prognosis of a fiscal crisis. And I think this is what the entire wor Western world, I should say, almost the entire Western world is looking at. And why is that? Well, it's basically two reasons. Entitlement programs, the so-called mandatory programs, where government passes a law saying, hey, if, if, if you do X, we're going to give you Y amount of money. And guess what? People figure out, hmm, I want to do X because I'm going to get Y amount of money. Uh, people respond to incentives. Uh, and demographics, of course, we have an aging population. Every year I get older, I think that's a better and better idea. So it's obviously, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny. Government demographers think aging population is a bad idea. Uh, and they probably think that even if they're 75 themselves. Uh, but it's not just aging populations. It's also falling birth rates. Uh, now, in theory, in theory, in a free society, it shouldn't matter how long people are living or how many kids they're having. But when you have entitlement programs 
imposed upon a free society, what happens? Well, when you have a population pyramid, you, you all teach it that way in Denmark, you know, population pyramid, you have a few old people at the top, then you have your working age people, then you have a bigger generation of children underneath them. When you have a population pyramid, entitlement programs, tax and transfer entitlement programs, sort of work. As a libertarian, I would never recommend them, but if you have a population pyramid, they can work, because what are they? They're basically Ponzi schemes. And Ponzi schemes work so long as there's always an increasing amount of people coming into the system. You know what Ponzi schemes are, right? Uh, so, so, yeah, for a long time, we had the population pyramid, and it sort of worked. But what's happening over time with, with uh, aging populations and falling birth rates, the pyramid is becoming a cylinder. And with a population cylinder, it simply doesn't work. Tax and transfer entitlement programs are going to fundamentally uh, go bankrupt, especially since, what do we know about politicians? They usually won't address a problem until it becomes a crisis. Why? Because their time horizon is the next election. They're always thinking, oh, I don't want to do anything that might get someone to vote against me. I mean, these are, I mean, these are pathologically insecure people. Their entire self-worth is tied up into the fact that, oh, somebody voted for me. It made up for the fact that I was never picked first in gym class, uh, and, and all the other kids laughed at me in the locker room. So, so, so the politicians are, you know, the, we have these bad numbers built in. The politicians won't deal with it. So what's the answer? Is it time to, you know, we have these people called preppers in America. And, and they literally, they buy property in rural areas and they stock up on ammunition and bottled water and, 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 uh, and, and canned goods. And, and they're just expecting the world to fall apart. They see what's happening in Europe, uh, in the, in the, the so-called pigs countries, so the club med countries, whatever you want to call them. They think, oh my God, well, they're being bailed out by the IMF and the ECB and stuff like that. But when it happens in America, there's nobody big enough to bail us out. So we better prepare for the worst. You know, remember that Mel Gibson movie, Mad Max, that they think that's what the world's going to become. Uh, and you know what? There's some reason to think that might be the case if we don't start making changes. I'm going to show you some charts from a study from the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. Very boring, sober-minded international bureaucracy. So you would sort of think, especially since they're Swiss, they're probably getting these numbers right. Uh, they looked at, not for Denmark, they only picked like a, you know, nine or ten, whatever countries, but Denmark wasn't one of them. But they basically looked at what's going to happen between now well, of course, they did the study. It came out in 2011. But they looked at, uh, between 2011 and 2040, what's going to happen to the burden of government debt? Now, I want to stop here for a caveat. The fiscal policy problem in France and every other country is not red ink. It is not deficits of debt. It's government spending. Because government spending, whether it's financed by taxes or borrowing, what is it doing? It's diverting resources from the productive sector of the economy. It's sort of like if I go to a doctor and I say, doctor, oh, I was having these really bad headaches. And the doctor looks at me, examines me, gives me the MRI, the CAT scan, whatever, and he says, Dan, you have a tumor. Am I going to say to the doctor, OK, well, good, give me some aspirin for my headache? No. Well, maybe I'll say that, but I'll say, get rid of the tumor somehow. I want the doctor to deal with the underlying problem. I don't want him just to treat the symptoms. And so politicians, they sometimes want us to focus on, on the deficit and debt, because then they can say the answer is higher taxes. But if all you're doing is trading debt finance government spending for tax finance government spending, you're still leaving the underlying problem of a public sector that's too big of a drain on the economy in place. So anyhow, so I, I don't, I wish the BIS measured government spending. And of course, these really are proxies for government spending, because it's all proxies for entitlement spending and aging populations. But anyhow, the red line is the baseline scenario. This is what will happen in France if they do nothing. This is what happens in France if they do a good bit of reform. And this is what happens if they basically uh, freeze age-related spending. So that would be a pretty big step. And keep in mind that Greece got in trouble at 113% of GDP. Spain and Portugal needed a bailout at about 85% of GDP for government debt. So, so at some point, the bond vigilantes out there, the international investors, they look at a country, government's growing too big, uh, economic growth is slowing, and they think, hmm, I don't really trust those people to pay me back. Maybe I'm not going to lend them more money. And that's when the fiscal crisis hits. And remember, 
185 to 113% of GDP are the recent numbers where we saw fiscal crises in, this, uh, in the Mediterranean countries. France is going up to 400% of GDP. Guess what? Before they get to that point, they're going to have a fiscal crisis. As a matter of fact, uh, this is a very risky uh, prediction, but the next three countries to look for a fiscal crisis, Japan, France, and Belgium. So if you have lots of investments there, I would encourage you to be very, very careful about them. Matter of fact, sell all those investments and send the money to either CPOS or the Cato Institute. Uh, that would be the right thing to do. Uh, so here's France, 400% of GDP. Here's Germany. I thought the Germans were supposed to be the fiscally responsible ones. They're going up to 300% of GDP if they do nothing. Again, it's a simple factor of an aging population and falling birth rates. So even the Germans who we sort of think of as being you know, very responsible, uh-uh, they're in trouble. Greece, well, we already know Greece, you know, uh, you know, th these numbers are, are far worse than they were three years ago. Uh, so just think about how bad they are now, but they're heading up to 400% of GDP. And again, they're, they're not gonna get there because they're either going to be living off Danish taxpayers for those next 26 years uh, or somebody else. Uh, but they're, you know, no one's going to lend them money with such a grim fiscal outlook. Here's Ireland. Uh, they, they made a lot of progress when they were, were reducing government spending, but then they had the property bubble. They did the completely foolish bailouts of their banks. They should have done what Iceland did, just let the banks go under, let the bondholders take a bath. But they didn't, and so now Ice, uh, Ireland is in the deep long-run trouble, heading up to 300% of GDP. Here's Italy. I'm actually surprised Italy's in better shape than Germany in the long run. Go figure. I don't know, maybe the Swiss made a mistake in their study, and it actually shows that Italy can, you know, can turn things around if they do a good bit of reform. Actually, every country can turn things around. I'll explain that a little bit later. Here's the Netherlands, another surprise. I sort of think of the, the, the Dutch as being like the Germans, uh, very responsible, but no, they're heading up to 400% of GDP, as bad as France. Uh, I guess if you're, well, they don't even border France because Belgium's in between, so it's not, it's not even like they have fiscal irresponsibility by, by uh, proximity. Here's Japan. I said sell your Japanese investments, 600% of GDP. And even if they do lots of reforms, 400% of GDP. We're going to see a very interesting social science experiment. What happens when a society collapses? This really could be Mad Max uh, with Mel Gibson. Now, the Japanese. They're already up at 200% of GDP. How are they getting away with this? Because they domestically finance their debt. They have a high savings rate, and government regulations sort of steer all that savings into these Japanese postal banks, which then regulatory pressure is to use it all to buy up government debt. So they're lending themselves money, but guess what happens as the demographic tide flips over? And you know their, their, their demographics are worse than, I think, any European country. Uh, it, it's just it's going to be a nightmare. Bad things will happen. Here's Portugal, 300% of GDP. Again, these numbers are worse. You know, if we looked at the numbers today, they'd be worse than the chart shows. Same thing for Spain, 300% of GDP, but I'm sure it's worse. Here's the UK. How many times do we hear, oh, the Anglo-Saxon countries, you know, they're, they're responsible. No, the UK, anywhere between 300% and 500% of GDP. Uh, in other words, they're in deep, deep trouble as well. But now, let's have a drum roll because we're going to look at the United States. We're the free market superpower. No, we're not. 450% of GDP. Uh, we're in very, very deep trouble, worse than most of the European welfare states. And again, even if we do a lot of reform, look what happens. Now, these are all just Bank for International Settlements numbers. And some of you may be thinking, well, maybe someone who doesn't know what they're talking about did that report. So let's go ahead and look at a couple of numbers from other bureaucracies. Here's a chart from the OECD. And what this shows is instead of by 2040, it's 2050, and it's the amount of fiscal consolidation you need to do every single year between now and 2050 in order to stabilize your debt at 50% of GDP. The good news, by the way, for you guys, look at Denmark. You have a big government, but you pay for it. It's, it's, it's not what I would recommend, but compared to Greece, which has a big government and doesn't pay for it, you're doing okay. And you know the Swedes, uh, uh, the, the Swiss, uh, I'm, I'm really am surprised Italy's here. It's, something just doesn't add up with all that. Uh, but let's look at the other end of the chart. You, you don't need to be able to read everything. All you need to know is that you don't want to be over here. Japan, New Zealand, United States. We're worse than Greece, France, and Italy. 
I mean, a lot worse than Italy, since they're somehow mysteriously way over there. Uh, but you know, th that's very bad. I mean, you know, think about this. This is about 10% of GDP if you go over here. U.S. GDP is $17 trillion. We're getting close to that. So 10% of GDP is $1.7 trillion of fiscal consolidation every year between now and 2050. O Obama's not doing that. He's going in the other direction. Bush didn't do that. He went in the other direction. Finally, let's look at something from the IMF. Again, very complicated chart, so I'm going to explain all you need to focus on. This is fiscal consolidation needed. This is by just 2030, so we're, we're only talking 16 years from now. So this is fiscal consolidation needed on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis, you have the, uh, the age-related spending increase. So I actually like this chart. It's focusing on the real disease of government spending, not just the symptom of debt. But in other words, if government spending is growing this much and fiscal consolidation needed is on the horizontal axis. In other words, you don't want to be in the upper right quadrant, United States. Japan has to do more fiscal consolidation. Belgium has bigger spending increases. But you know, basically, you know, Denmark, I mean, on, on this chart, Denmark, Denmark, yeah, Denmark. Uh, the Denmark, you know, you're right in the middle. I mean, you still have, that's still 4.5% of GDP, and that's still uh, uh, about a 4 percentage point uh, increase in the burden of government spending as a share of GDP just on age-related uh, spending programs. Uh, but again, you know, the U.S., look at all these countries in, in deep, deep trouble. Uh, and that's just 2030. And remember, this is fiscal adjustment that has to be maintained every single year. In other words, it's not just that you have to do it once. You have to maintain and discipline your politicians to do it over and over and over again. So instead of making things worse every year, you're actually somehow magically expecting them to make things better every year. That's obviously a very challenging uh, thing to do. So what does it boil down to? This is what's happening to the Western world. Uh, this cartoon from Chuck Assay, he unfortunately retired, but you know, taxpayers are being drained dry by all the greedy little interest groups that have their snout stuck in the public trough. Uh, now some of these are you know, distinctly American programs, but you, know, you get the idea. Think of all the interest groups in the Danish economy that want to live off the government, and, and these are the poor taxpayers who are paying 56% marginal tax rates on, on income that's just a little bit over the average. Well, that's ridiculous, and 42% capital gains taxes and dividends taxes, and then what little money you have left after the government turns you upside down and shakes you out, you have to pay a 25% VAT. I mean, what are you people doing? You should have pitchforks marching on the, on, on, on the, on the prime minister's uh, residence or something like that. <laughs> but now I'm going to get to my optimistic uh, part of the presentation uh, and try to give us some reason for hope. And it's not even going to rely on you people picking up pitchforks and, uh, uh, and, uh, and marching on uh, the, the parliament. Uh, I do think that the fiscal crisis has, has really, and I think I said this already, has sobered up. Uh, people uh, and, and that there's an agreement that change is needed. Now, there's good change and there's bad change. The bad change, of course, is that the politicians always want more tax revenue. Uh, that's what we saw. The first thing that happened with the fiscal crisis in the Club Med countries, what do they do? They all raised income tax rates. They all raised VAT rates. The first instinct of a politician is always to figure out how can I extract more money from the productive sector of the economy. They don't want to. Uh, they don't want to try to reform the programs because the programs is how they buy votes. They get people hooked on government dependency, uh, and then that makes them into dependable supporters. Uh, so they're going to go for higher taxes. They've already been doing that. Uh, but I think the pendulum may swing in the other direction because we're already seeing even the IMF, which is a very tax-happy bureaucracy, even the IMF said in a recent one of their consultations on Greece, said Greece has probably reached the tipping point where more tax increases will lose revenue. In other words, they explicitly recognized the Laffer curve. Uh, I can't even get politicians in the US to recognize that. Uh, so, so I think as it, as it becomes obvious that feeding the beast with more taxes doesn't work, when all other options are exhausted, People are forced to do the right thing. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, uh, politicians will do the right thing. But I want to point out that you don't have to do anything radical. I'm a libertarian. I work at the Cato Institute. I want to do radical things. 
I want to get rid of entire departments of the federal government. I want to completely privatize entitlements. I want to shrink the federal government back down to 3% of GDP, where it was for much of our nation's history. But here's all you need to understand. If, you're, if your nominal GDP is supposed to grow about 4.5% a year, which is what our Congressional Budget Office is predicting, which isn't very much, that's actually a weak growth projection, all you have to do to make progress is to make sure government grows slower than that. Think about it. If nominal GDP is growing this fast, guess what? Tax revenue is going to grow that fast because what's nominal GDP? It's your tax base. So if, if nominal GDP and tax revenue are growing this fast, do you want government spending to grow this fast or this fast? By the way, what am I doing here? It's called the German PowerPoint slide. Um, <laughs> Or who, 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 are, who, are, who do you make fun of, the, the Swedes or someone? Uh, yeah, a, a Swedish PowerPoint slide. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's good to actually dramatically cut government spending, but if you simply make sure you have government grow slower than the private sector, good things happen. And my friend Art Laffer, he's famous for the Laffer curve. Uh, I have to name things after myself in hopes that I'm going to get famous someday. But I really think this is a good golden rule for fiscal policy. Don't focus on deficits or debt. That's a trick by the politicians. They want you to, oh, look at this shiny object of a deficit. Shouldn't you give me more money in a tax increase? That's what they're trying to tell you. If you focus on simply this, hey, politician, is government going to grow faster or slower than private GDP next year? you force them to answer that question, you're much more likely to get good policy. So if the private sector grows faster than the government, or you know, you know, there's a glass half full people, glass half empty people, you could say the government should grow slower than the private sector. Whatever way you want to say it, that is the key. Make sure those trend lines are in the right direction. Why did Greece get in trouble? Because for decades, government was growing this fast and the private sector was growing this fast. You do that long enough, you're gonna get, you're gonna just kill your economy. And likewise, if you flip those lines so that you're obeying the golden rule, sooner or later, you're going to dig yourself out of trouble. You could be Greece. You could have a giant problem right now. But as long as you have government growing slower than the private sector, sooner or later, you're going to get out of the trouble. Or since their economy is contracting, government has to contract faster than the private economy contracts. But you keep doing that long enough, and then the private economy will start growing again. Now, I want to look at some real world evidence. This actually does happen. Uh, and I, I put a lot of these examples on my blog. It happened under Reagan and Clinton, but Ireland in the 1980s, New Zealand, Sweden, and Canada in the 1990s, Slovakia, Germany, and Estonia this century. But I really like the example of Switzerland. Why do I like the example of Switzerland? Because they impose something called a debt break. But it's really not a debt break, it's a spending cap. They basically say that spending can't grow faster than the average of revenues over a five-year period. And what that does, well, let's look at this chart. The spending cap was imposed by voters. By the way, 85.7% of voters imposed the debt break uh, in the early part of last decade. And ever since then, look what's happened to GDP and look what's happened to government spending. And because GDP grew faster than government spending, the burden of spending measured as a share of GDP fell. So while the rest of Europe's going in the wrong direction, the Swiss had a very stable, sensible rule that forced politicians to basically control their appetites. It's like giving one of your children an allowance and forcing them to live under the allowance to learn responsibility. The Swiss people put their government on an allowance and it's working very, very well. Uh, even the pigs, even the pigs, the, the, the blue bars are what happened to spending from 2002 to 2008. You see how Spain, Greece, and Ireland were, oh my look, 10% annual spending increases uh, for Ireland. Uh, even you know, Portugal and Italy were more responsible, but look what's happened from 2008 to 2011. Actually, the 2012 numbers are probably finalized now, so I should update this chart. But you can actually see Greece was finally forced to cut spending. And even the other countries were forced to reduce the growth of spending. The problem is, can you maintain it? The, the thing that makes the Swiss debt break so attractive, it's a rule in their constitution imposed by voters that says you have to maintain it. Now, of course, in the US, where Obama just waves a magic wand and ignores the law, maybe if we had a debt break, it wouldn't really matter. But I think other countries should copy the Swiss debt break, especially if they have good rule of law, which is something that Denmark, to its great credit, does have. 
So let's go ahead. I don't know whether I've talked 45 minutes, but I'm going to shut up because uh, nobody's asked me a question, so I'm feeling very ignored. We have, we have, three, we have three challenges. First, we have to correctly identify the problem, and this is vitally important. I mean, Denmark has been pretty good about following a fiscal balance rule, but that fiscal balance rule still leaves your burden of government very high. It simply means that whatever politicians spend, they also figure out a way to take it from you. So it's sort of like, oh, they're stabbing me on the left side, but hey, they're balancing it out by stabbing me on the right side. I don't think that's a great, uh, a, a great response. Remember, deficits and debt are the symptoms. Big government is the, is the disease. And obviously, if your problem is government spending and you want to follow the golden rule, you have to bend the cost curve of government down. I'd like to do radical things. I'd like to bring government back down to 10% of GDP, which is where it was in the Western world when we all became rich countries. But we don't even need to do that. Just make sure government grows slower than the private sector. But this is where I close out with my libertarian philosophy. The only way in the long run we're going to achieve some of these things is we have to convince people that liberty is better than dependency. Living off the state, mooching off your fellow man, using the government to steal and be the middleman to, to take your neighbor's money is not a good way to go through life. Thank you very much. Do we have questions on, you can have, ask questions on anything I said. You can ask questions about what I think about the next year's baseball season in America. <laughs> Over there. Yeah, I have a question about uh, having interventions in monetary policy because it's going to like put all on the left side so that the real rate lower bound. And they put that into a standard application model to charge that even use, uh, useless spending would ha have a cost effect and multiply that. Uh, I didn't talk much about monetary policy for the simple reason that I find the whole topic tedious. I mentioned that, that easy money policy is like pushing on a string, but I didn't really get into it beyond that. I suppose one thing I should have added, uh, and I'll limit my response to this because I just, again, I, I try to avoid monetary policy. One, I mentioned that politicians might raise taxes or try to raise taxes as the population ages and all these entitlement programs begin to cost more and more. Well, obviously, they have another alternative. They could also just print money figuratively or in the case of like Argentina and Zimbabwe, literally, they could print money to try to pay their bills. So, so maybe some sort of hyperinflation threat uh, is in the future, and that's something that should worry us as well. Uh, but but I, I don't, I suppose the one thing I'll say about monetary policy, you don't cure the problems in your real economy, high levels of spending, taxes, regulation, and red tape, you don't cure that by printing more money. I just don't think it's the right answer. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't follow monetary policy close enough to really you know, quibble about, well, should we cut off, the, should the taper be faster or slower right now? I just know that in the long run, printing money is not a route to economic prosperity. You have to get your underlying real economy fundamentals right. Uh, Tiedemann, Paul Tiedemann, external examiner from the uh, universities. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot of examples from the classical uh, European economics, uh, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, and so on, uh, where we are basing our, col our social security on collective basis, collective social security. We all pay in, and then we all try to get something out, better or worse. Uh, you never mentioned Singapore as a case. Could you give us a few words? On, on, on Singapore, where they're having a more individually oriented uh, model. Thank you. Yeah, well, what Singapore has is, a, is something called the Central Provident Fund. And basically, their pension and their healthcare systems are based on private mandatory savings. Um, I don't think it's the best model. Uh, I think the Australian Chilean model is better because in the, in the Provident Fund system, the government controls the investing. Whereas in the Chilean, Australian system, which is used by about 30 countries around the world now, including to some extent in Switzerland, uh, you are private fund management. Now, Switzerland, I don't know, not Switzerland, Singapore is probably a lot more responsible with its provident fund than, say, if the Greek government was doing it. So I do think culture matters. And, and, and 
mean, I guess the way to think about Singapore, it's an efficient post office. Not exactly the model I want to follow. And actually, total government spending is, is about 20% of GDP, so it's still one of the most small government economies in the developed world. Uh, but, but the central provident fund model, is it better than what we have in the US and a lot of Western countries? Yes. Is it better than Chile, Australia, uh, uh, Switzerland? No. Um, so there'd be a ranking of what's, you know, how far in the right direction we can go. Yeah, you talk about a lot about deficits, but I think in our part of the world, it's not really a problem. Uh, the politicians actually correct the system pretty well, but we do have a big problem in growth. And you kind of kind of touched it with the slides of the income from the U.S. and when the government of U.S. is is bigger and bigger, it actually edges out the growth. And I don't think deficits. I, I, I believe you can could make these slides in the 70s and see see where you're going mm. in 2014. Now you're all you're all going broke. But uh, in our part of the world, you mentioned 4.5. In Denmark, that hasn't been the case in forever. If, if we are lucky, if we get 1.8, I would guess someone from the finance ministers here they they would say the same thing. So I think growth is the real problem, not actually deficits. Okay. Um, well, then, then, then I, I should have probably connected the dots better, and that's my fault. One of the reasons I keep, I, I said, I think several times, government spending is the problem, deficits and debt are the symptoms. Well, why is government spending the problem? Because it's displacing resources from the private sector. It's diverting labor and capital from where the private sector will use it with an, a bottom line efficiency to try to satisfy consumers' needs versus political uh, allocation of resources, which, ha which happens when government is spending the money. So I think De Denmark, for that matter, Sweden, assuming that all your neighbors aren't going up in smoke with their Mad Max catastrophes, Denmark and Sweden and countries like that can probably continue forever. But if you're continuing forever with government consuming half of your GDP, you're probably never going to get those rapid growth levels. Uh, now, I haven't looked at historical numbers for Denmark, but I have looked at historical numbers for, for Sweden. Actually, I haven't looked at them. Vito Tanzi, formerly managing director, uh, uh, manager of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF, uh, looked at them. And, and Sweden, if you go back to like 1870, 1913, Sweden total government spending was 10% of GDP. And even as late as 1960, it was only about 25% of GDP. So Sweden became a rich country. And I wouldn't be surprised if Denmark's numbers were very similar. Sweden became a rich country when it had very laissez, actually, it still has laissez-faire policies, but it became very rich when it had laissez-faire and small government. Ever since the 1960s, it began to adopt the welfare state. It's been growing slower. It peaked at like the fourth richest country in the world in 1970, and now it's down around like 17 or 18. So, I mean, it's still growing, but it's going to go, what, you know, 1.75% 1, 1 or whatever it is averaging. You know, if you're already a rich country, I guess you can deal with that and be happy. Uh, but you're right, G growth is the key, but that's why growth requires free markets and small government. Denmark, by world standards, has very good free markets, but it also has the big government. That's the problem that I think Denmark has to address. Uh, now, it doesn't have to do radical things. They can just figure out over time, let's do something like the Swiss debt break, uh, force government spending to grow very slow in real terms, and you know, begin to leave more resources in the private sector. Uh, you know, Danish workers, so you look at output per hour productivity type numbers, da Danish workers are way up there. So with a little bit more leeway for the private sector to breathe and operate, I think Denmark could have, could have very good growth numbers. I mean, obviously, there's a, you get talk to economists, we'll start getting really boring about your production frontier and all that kind of nonsense. And if you're already a rich country, it's harder to grow fast than if you're a poor country. But, but you can grow faster. That's what it boils down to. Hey, Tony Karaya, uh, I'm an economist just like you. I work at T-Global. Um, Perhaps we need to imagine a new model. If you, have, if you look at the Chinese model, they have uh, communism as the building block, and that's liberalism or capitalism is integrated in that model. That is outcompete within 20, 30 years, the American model and the European model. You, have, you didn't come into to Nobel Prize guys like Keynes, Hayek, but what you're trying to say with your rule is that, okay, if the private sector does not grow so much, 
we should cut the government as much. I tell you, you would have a social uprising in Europe, as you see in the pigs' country. So the politicians say, we don't want social political uprising, so we're going to yeah. invest like Keynes. So my, you know, we've tried this before, and there is a specific unique reaction in your own country when you leave one big company to fail. They say, we're not going to let the whole economy fail, so we need to protect IEG in comparison to other companies that could bring down the whole economy. In Denmark, you had the Danish bank, that you leave some banks to fail, but this is too big for fail. And if you sit in one of these big block private banks, you know the government is going to bail you out, so you have a leverage. Don't, don't we need to rethink the whole economic model, rewrite all the books, and look at the Chinese model? Uh, all right, well, th th there's, there are several points there and some very good questions. L let me at least try to make sure I fo answer the big ones. On the Chinese economic model, uh, they've had several decades now of very fast growth, but guess what? They still only have one-sixth the per capita GDP of America. Uh, you know, so if you start in absolute miserable poverty, it still takes you a long, long, long time uh, to climb. They've had decades of very rapid growth, mostly because they've liberalized to world trade. So, so on, on those economic freedom of the world indicators, uh, they made dramatic progress on one of the indicators, but if you look at their rankings, they're still not a very highly ranked country. So I think China is exploiting, uh, in a good way, trade, but I think that puts a limit on how far they can grow. I think the, the lack of uh, transparency in their financial system, the crony capitalism with the princelings, I think are major, major problems that may hold China back. Now, the Chinese people, I mean, I just was flattering the Danish people being a good speaker. Well, if you look at output per hour in places like Singapore and Hong Kong, the Chinese people, given free markets, do a great job. And so if China ever actually, if they really just imported the Hong Kong model into their country, uh, yeah, I think they would surpass the United States. I don't think they're going to surpass the United States uh, right now. Uh, on the issue of bailouts, uh, AIG, stuff like that, uh, I would agree that at the height of the crisis, it probably was prudent for the government to recapitalize the financial system. But there's good ways and bad ways, or let me put it, there are bad ways and there are worse ways to do it. Uh, when it was happening, and this was still during the Bush years, I remember going into the White House, I remember going into the Treasury Department, the Council of Economic Advisors, anybody who would talk to me, and I kept telling them, do the FDIC resolution approach. What's the FDIC resolution approach? It basically means if there's a bank that's bankrupt, you put it into government receivership, just like if a company goes bankrupt, it goes into bankruptcy court, but financial institutions are different because of their, the nature of their liabilities. But have the government basically have an orderly managed bankruptcy and sell off the assets. We did that with the SNLs back in 1989, 1990. And, and I remember going into the Bush people and saying, look, Paulson, the Treasury Secretary, he wants, he wants you to give him a $700 billion blank check for his friends on Wall Street. Give that $700 billion check to the FD, because the FDIC didn't have the authorized resources. We did do FDIC resolution with WAMU and IndyMac, two big banks, early in the process, but that used up their, their, their authority, their, their monetary cap. If we had simply said, okay, FDIC, here's $700 billion, shut down the bad banks, we would have had a much better approach. Why? Because the bondholders would have been, the shareholders would have been, guess what? Capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without hell. <laughs> What's the whole point? <laughs> I want people, I want people for their own good, for their own good, I want people who touch hot stoves to go, ow, because they learn not to touch hot stoves. Instead, what we got is exactly what you were suggesting. We have this too big to fail problem now where we have these so-called systematically important institutions that basically have a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac type subsidy from the Treasury because of the knowledge that, hey, if you lend them money as a bondholder, if you buy their shares as a stockholder, you're going to be protected. That's cronyism. That's not capitalism. Uh, so yeah, no, great questions, but I think, you know, I think the answer is less government, not more. Just real quickly on Keynes, uh, uh, and then I'll go to another question. Keynesianism didn't work for Hoover and Roosevelt in the 30s. It didn't work for uh, 
uh, Ford and Carter in the 70s. It didn't work for Japan in the 90s. It didn't work for Bush in 2008. didn't work for Obama in 2009. I keep asking Keynesians, yes, you guys can do really elegant models on a blackboard, but show me one bit of evidence from the real world that it works. And, and that's what they're not so, so good at. Now, what they always say back, I'll give you their answer, oh, oh no, you're wrong. Because if Hoover and Roosevelt hadn't spent what they did spend, it would have been worse. And if Obama hadn't spent what he spent, it would have been worse. So you get like the Congressional Budget Office in the US, which is a bunch of Keynesians, that they say, oh, well, Obama's stimulus created 4.5 million jobs or whatever it was. Well, how do you know that? Well, because that's what our model says. And literally, the, the CBO director was asked this in congressional te testimony. So you didn't actually try to measure jobs. You just have a model that automatically spit out that result. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, that's really scientific. Uh, you know, so no, I, other questions? Yes, we have one here. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. right over here, and then come back over here. Yeah, I'm uh, Thomas Gress. I'm a student assistant here. Uh, so the general theme, it seems, is that with an aging population, it's putting an increased burden on public pensions and healthcare spending in countries where this is part of the public, uh, or the, yeah, the government spending. And I'm wondering, you were optimistic about people starting, at least in the United States, starting to vote almost in their own, against their own self-interest. Because as the population a ages, and these voters, I would guess, would have an interest in voting for increased spending, so how, what makes you think that these, this increasing elderly generation are going to vote against their self-interest in this matter? Um, for, for one very good reason. If you're a flea, is it good if the dog that you're on dies? Uh, remember remember uh, this cartoon? Are these piglets better off now that they've killed the pig, the sow? No. Uh, now, I would like it not to get to this point, and I have to say, I have admiration for Sweden and Denmark. Both Sweden and Denmark have done reforms to pensions so that they're now adjusted to life expectancy, if I understand correctly. I know that's the case in Sweden, and yes, Mads is nodding his head. And, you, know, you guys did it before it became a, a crisis. So, you know, so the political culture is probably better in Nordic countries than it is in a lot of the world. We're not going to address it in the US, I don't think, until it becomes a crisis. Although I have to say, you know, let me say something in defense of, I mean, very rarely do I defend American politicians, but for three years in a row, the House of Representatives has voted for the Ryan budget, which contains genuine structural reform of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, now, obviously, the Senate blocked it, and even if the Senate didn't block it, Obama would have vetoed it. But you know, we're doing that before the crisis hits or at least the House is trying to do it before the crisis hits. So maybe, just maybe, you know, knock on wood, or, you know, wherever there's some wood. Uh, you know, if Republicans take the Senate with some Tea Party types, not the old corrupt establishment types, uh, and you get someone like a Rand Paul, Marco Rubio, uh, uh, Governor Walker of Wisconsin, you get someone like that in the White House, maybe, just maybe, the United States will be saved. I wouldn't necessarily bet on it, uh, but, but what the House has done does gives, gives me a little reason for optimism because they took those votes knowing that they were going to have campaign commercials against them that they hated old people, and they did. They, there was a there was a campaign commercial showing Congressman Paul Ryan, or at least a, a guy who was made up to look like him, pushing an old woman in a wheelchair off a cliff. <laughs> so so imagine you're a politician, you sort of know, you know God, you know, if we don't fix these problems, we're really going to be hurt as a country. But if I vote for it, it's not going to go past Obama anyhow, so why vote for it? I'll just get these ads against me, but they still did it. So I, I thought that was, a, that was an example of genuine patriotism, doing the right thing for the right reason for your country. Uh, American politicians don't often do it, so I want to give them credit the one time they did. OK, and then we have that guy back there. I want to make sure we don't forget him. Okay, okay, I'll start. Uh, I never. Uh, my name is Mikkel. I never read uh, any economic books, so I'm gonna That's probably ask, good. Uh, <laughs> ask a question about the domestic uh, policies in the states, because you, uh, like uh, you said, it's very popular to um, be negative towards Obamacare. So, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I see it, uh, the United States has the most expensive and least efficient healthcare system in the Western world, and and all. And when I see. Uh, Fox News or CNN, they they had they say the same thing as you. But what's the alternative to the Obamacare? Because 
mm-hmm. it seems like it's a it's a big spending it's a big government spending and and privatizing the american healthcare system hasn't i mean wasn't it Reagan that screwed that one up so so what what is the alternative yeah uh I did an estimate, very rough estimate, you know, I, no science to it, but I sort of just you know, looked at the numbers. Before Obamacare was enacted, 48 cents out of every healthcare dollar in America was spent by government. And even in the parts of our healthcare system that theoretically were the private sector, the health insurance system we have is an artifact of government regulation and tax policy. Uh, you know, we have a big giant tax break if we get compensation in the form of fringe benefits. So if, if I get a health insurance policy from my employee, from my employer, which I do, because I get that in the form of fringe benefits, there's no 28%, 31%, 35%, whatever your tax bracket is, there's no income tax on that money. There's no 15.3% payroll tax on that money. You get a giant tax preference if you get your compensation in the form of fringe benefits. So we have a system that encourages what are called Cadillac or gold-plated healthcare plans. Now, what does that do? It basically means that between the parts of our healthcare system, like Medicaid and Medicare, where government is the single-payer provider, and the government distorted, but nominally private parts of our healthcare system, like the employee, employer-based insurance system, we have a system where we, that has created a massive third-party payer crisis. What's a third-party payer crisis? It's when somebody other than the consumer pays. What if I told all of you, hey, after this lecture, go out to dinner, and I'm going to pay 89% of your bill? Think about that. Are you more likely to go to McDonald's or are you more likely to go to the best restaurant in town? Remember, this idiotic American said he's going to pay 89% of your bill. Of course, if you have any brains, you're going to go to the most expensive restaurant because, hey, we got some idiot who's going to pick up the check or almost all the check. Well, in America, before Obamacare, before Obamacare, 89 cents out of every healthcare dollar was paid for by somebody other than the consumer. That's a crazy system. So of course we have rapidly rising out of control costs because what incentive, let's say I'm a doctor or a hospital or some other healthcare provider, what incentive do I have to control cost? Just like if you went out you know, to a restaurant knowing I was gonna pay 89%, the restaurant, if they knew that ahead of time, they'd probably, oh, let's double or triple our price because th- this guy's not gonna be very sensitive to price because somebody else is p- picking up the tab. So we have a giant third party payer crisis in America before Obamacare and Obamacare simply makes it worse. And so I did an estimate that we were a 68% government controlled healthcare system before Obamacare and now we're 79%. Now that could be, you know, Again, it was just sort of a back of the envelope, as we say, type calculation. What we need, what we need is to have more first party payer. But politicians don't like that because politicians like going to voters and saying, oh, your health care bill was too high. We're going to have the insurance company pay it. We're going to have the government pay it. Someone's going to pay it. And everyone says, oh, good, man, because I don't like paying that. You know, what if car insurance worked the same way? Imagine if your car insurance, instead of being like if you had an accident and you had a couple of thousand dollars or kroner or euro, whatever, of damage, what if your car insurance covered everything? Oh, I went to the gas station, let me fill out a bunch of forms, uh, and then you know it's now third party payer. Oh, what do you know? The gas is twice as expensive, but I don't care because I'm submitting it to the insurance company. And of course, you know, this is all done in a, if you were an American, it'd be done through your employer. So you wouldn't even know that your pay was being reduced because you were getting this big car insurance policy. Uh, all you know is, okay, I'm getting an oil change. Uh, you know, it, that would be insane. Or what about what if your home insurance was that way? And so instead of you know, waiting to use your homeowner's insurance if you have a fire, oh, I bought a new chair for the, for the dining room. Oh, I repainted the living room. Let's go through all this bureaucracy, fill out all these forms. Oh, guess what? I went to the hardware store. I didn't care that paint now cost $100 a gallon uh, when it used to cost $12 a gallon because I'm not paying for it. Somebody else is. So, so, so our third party payer problem is a nightmare in America. Uh, our system is definitely more government controlled than say the Swiss system. I don't know about the Danish system at all, but we have major problems. But it was, it's all the government policies that have done it, I think. Uh, and the question is, how do we fix it? 
Well, that's a real challenge, because it's like putting toothpaste back in a tube. And putting toothpaste back in a tube when you have people out there who have been trained by decades of government intervention to think that it's not their responsibility to pay for health care. Now, interestingly, and I'll, I'm giving a very long answer, so I'll shut up on this last point. We do have a few sectors of our economy, of our health care economy, where consumers actually pay out of pocket. Laser eye surgery, cosmetic surgery, uh, and uh, what's the other example? Uh, oh, abortion. Whether you think it's good or bad, it's, it's a first party payer thing. And what do we notice in all those three areas? Year after year after year, quality goes up and prices go down. I don't know how you measure the quality of an abortion, but, but on, things like, on, <laughs> on things like laser eye surgery and cosmetic surgery, there are definitely, I mean, you know, if, you go in, if you went in 20 years ago to get laser eye surgery, I don't even know if they had it 20 years ago, but get, getting your eyes fixed today is far cheaper, far better, far more technologically proficient. Things like cosmetic surgery are you know, greatly advanced. And guess what? Prices go up slower than the general price level. Normally, you look at these charts, here's, here's healthcare spending, Here's general consumer spending. Well, here's general consumer spending, and here's things like cosmetic surgery, abortion, and things like that. So there's nothing about health care that won't work if we actually allow a free market. The problem is government intervention has destroyed just about any semblance of a free market in America. That being said, it is, that's one of the issues I'm most depressed about. Yeah, I think we have a pretty good way of dealing with Medicare and Medicaid, block grant Medicaid to the states and the Ryan budget, change Medicare to a voucher system, which probably would address third party payer system some, but you really have to do something like a flat tax, not just because it has low tax rates and no double taxation, but one of the big advantages of the Hall Rabushka flat tax that people like Dick Army and Steve Forbes talked about, one of the advantages is that fringe benefits are bought into the tax base, so they're taxable. So you no longer get like this big 40% tax break for getting income in the form of health insurance. So I think people would then be more, much more rational about, hey, let's just get a catastrophic policy, the same approach we use for homeowners insurance and auto insurance. I think you, know, so, so you have to do a lot of big changes, I think, to fix what's wrong with the healthcare system. So, sorry for the long answer, but it's a, it's a very complicated issue. Yes, sir. Uh, Carsten Best, um, I should like to ask you, do you have an explanation why these uh, money printing and QE programs all over the world, why haven't they um, made prices, inflation go up? Uh, most, uh, the, the, there are economics and politicians in Denmark who argue for these programs because they, in fact, want the uh, inflation to go up. And now they say that if we, that's uh, like the arguments you mentioned before, if we haven't done this, then we would have def had deflation, and that would be even worse. Um, and they uh, would like some kind of infl inflation because that could help um, making the competition level better, for example, in Denmark, because uh, wages are stiff downwards, and then we could create some money illusion for those with lowest wages so that we could lower real wages mm -hmm. without lowering uh, nominal wages. Yeah. How, well, is, how would you argue against them? <laughs> well, on, on the second point you're making, it, yes, of course politicians like inflation because what's inflation? Inflation's like you're on your third drink at the bar. Eh, you're feeling pretty good, you got a buzz going, uh, and, and you haven't hit any consequences. But maybe after you have seven drinks, you wake up the next day, you don't feel so hot. But that gets to the first question you asked, We've been drinking at the bar now for years. Where's the hangover? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know. Uh, I, and, and as I said to one of the other questions, I'm, not a, I'm a fiscal policy guy, not a monetary policy guy. So I'll just give you a few things I've heard other people say, people who I think are reasonably intelligent. First and foremost, the one thing that really seems to be persuasive is that banks in the US are now holding something like $1.7 trillion of excess reserves at the Fed. So the Fed is dumping, figuratively speaking, all this money into the economy, into the banking system, and banks hmm, are bringing it right back to the Fed. Uh, and why? Because at, with excess reserves at the Fed, the banks get, I think, one-eighth of 1% 1 interest, so they get a little bit of money on it. There's zero risk. Whereas when you have a weak economy like we have in America right now, if you lend it to someone in the private sector, you might not get paid back. 
Now, normally, banks would prefer lending to someone in the private sector because with a normal growing economy, you know, you figure your loans are going to generate an average rate of return, you know, the economy-wide rate of return, so it's better to lend to the private sector. You, know, you don't want to settle for one-eighth of one percent. But with a weak economy, maybe excess reserves, and $1.7 trillion is a big, big number, maybe that's the best you can do. The other explanation that I've heard is that, well, the stock market has basically doubled since the uh, downturn. Has the underlying real economy doubled? Is this perhaps a financial market bubble caused by the easy money policy from the Fed? I have no idea. I work at a think tank, so it's not like I have a lot of money to invest. Uh, you know, so you know, well, maybe that's the case. Um, but one final point on monetary policy. I know that my Austrian school colleagues would uh, uh, be upset at me if I didn't make one tiny correction. The inflation's already happened. The inflation is when the government creates the excess liquidity. Then we normally think of inflation as one of the symptoms, which is rising consumer prices. No, inflation is the creation of the, of the excess money, and then the symptoms are things like rising prices, stock market bubbles, excess reserves at the Fed, and things like that. But that's I'm being picky, uh, nitpicking there. One uh, question, uh, Dan, um, about your expectations about uh, the next election, uh, which uh, comes in 2016. If the Democrats and uh, Clinton wins the, the election, which reforms do you expect to be implemented? Uh, and similar, if the GOP party wins the presidency in 2016, uh, what do you think will be implemented when you look at reforms? Uh, well, first, th there's an election in 2014, the midterms, and right now, the Democrats, because of all the problems with Obamacare, uh, the Democrats are terrified. Uh, they expect to lose more seats in the House, uh, and they, right now, it looks like the Democrats will lose the Senate. Now, Obama will still have the White House, and in our separation of powers system that we have, not a parliamentary system, that means continued stalemate. But there's already stalemate now anyhow, because the Republicans hold the House. Uh, so in some sense, you're right. It's really 2016 that matters. If Hillary Clinton wins, um, I expect zero good reforms. We might get a really bad reform, a value-added tax, because a value-added tax added on top of our horrible income tax in the US would just be a money machine for big government. And then I think there'd be almost no hope of getting entitlement reform, because politicians would always figure, hey, let's just raise the VAT another point every other year, and that way we can sort of just postpone the day of reckoning. Uh, sort of what Greece did, and you see where that winds up. Uh, on the Republican side, I mean, Rand Paul is explicitly libertarian. I work at a libertarian think tank. I would assume that almost every libertarian in the U.S. sentimentally will want Rand Paul. Uh, he's definitely a much better politician than his father. Um, but all I really care about is saving the country, and that means doing the entitlement reforms in the Ryan budget. So any Republican, or for that matter, Democrat, because I don't, just don't think there are any uh, responsible Democrats on fiscal policy anymore, a any responsible, any reasonable Republican, uh, like Marco Rubio, uh, Scott Walker, you know, they would all do the Ryan budget, I think. And, and so, yeah, we could get some reforms. Now, timing matters. Our population is aging, and once we get, as we get closer to 2020, that's when you start having 10,000 people a day retiring onto Social Security and Medicare. Uh, if Hillary wins, and there's another four years at least until there's a chance for a real reform, I begin to wonder whether we get past the point of no return. Like, I think right now Greece is past the point of no return. Uh, when you have a majority of your voting age population mooching off the government, and seeing themselves explicitly as, as clients of big government, how do you get the political coalition to try to change things? Now, in theory, what I said before, I forget to which question, if you're a flea, you don't want the dog you're on to die. So even in Greece, you know, all, the, all the bureaucrats, all the welfare recipients, all the pensioners, you know, the, the, they should all unite and say, hey, we all have to step back away from the trough a bit so that, so that the system can survive. Uh, but the problem is there's a tragedy of the commons. No one interest group wants to back away from the trough because they just figure out, they figure everyone else will just get a better spot and eat more of the, uh, 
uh, eat more of uh, the taxpayer's money. Um, and the U.S. isn't there yet, but I worry that we're heading in that direction. Our, you look at the dependency ratio, the share of households that are getting checks from the government, it's moving in the wrong direction in the U.S. So uh, I don't think the U.S. is different than any place else in the world. People respond to incentives. And the more the incentives are that you can do better mooching off the government than producing, the more it's very grim for your society. And uh, so in that sense, uh, Hillary might be a very bad omen of long-term fiscal collapse in America. Sort of a very cheery uh, way to, I guess, <laughs> end things up. <laughs> Did we have any other uh, questions? Oh, we have a few more here. I, I don't know. You'll tell me. It's fine. It's fine. We have 10 minutes. OK, 10 minutes. OK, we're being efficient. In the book uh, by Rogoff and Reiner, if that's the correct way to pronounce it, they, um, you know, this time is different. They looked at debt over 800 years. They pointed out that when a country, the GDP hits, 90% uh, of the GDP is debt, that, that's a, an inflection point and it's really hard to recover. Is that still relevant or is really what you're saying, as long as uh, you bend the curve down, you can recover? Rogoff and Reinhardt had a lot of people like Krugman going through oh, the yeah. numbers and finding some mistakes, and, 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 but then Ro Rogoff and Reinhardt came back and you know, did some other data, and they said, no, no, we're right. Well, Japan's 200% of GDP. They're way above 90. They're way above 100. They're way above 110. But Rogoff and Reinhardt would say, well, we're looking at averages. And that's a very fair thing to say. When you're looking at multi-countries, obviously they're not all going to be the same, and it depends how much of their debt is domestically financed versus externally financed. Uh, <clears throat> frankly, there's psychology to it. It's when do the bond vigilantes, as they're called, strike? What are bond vigilantes? Those are the international investors that lend money to governments. And so if you're looking at Japan right now, you're thinking, well, you got all that Japanese domestic savings. Historically, it all goes into their government debt. Not all, but the vast majority of it goes into their government debt. Eh, I bet I can hold some Japanese bonds in my portfolio. I don't think they're going to default in the next 10 years. And that's probably a reasonable guess. Well, maybe a little bit optimistic, but you know, it might not be an un uh, you know, it, m it might be a reasonable guess. On the other hand, uh, <clears throat> France. Holland is almost like single-handedly trying to destroy the economy. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're over 100% of GDP. Uh, he's put in a 75% tax rate. He, he's, he, he's like he hates entrepreneurs and investors, the very people that generate growth. I mean, you know, aren't you sort of going to think as an, as an international investor, maybe I don't want to be in 10-year French government bonds. But, but psychologically, where is that point? Where is the point where the, the, these people, because in order to have a crisis, the trigger for the crisis is always the investor saying, we don't want to buy your debt anymore unless you give us some turbocharged premium on your interest rates, sort of what Greece was having to pay 15% and stuff like that. And at that point, you know, when your debt levels are so high, uh, you basically have to get bailed out or you have to default. Uh, so so I, I guess I'm just agnostic on Rogoff and Reinhardt. Uh, because every country will have a point where investors won't want to buy their debt, and that's when they officially have a crisis. But I want to focus attention, as I've said several times, on the government spending. Because if you don't focus on the government spending, uh, I don't think you're ever going to get the right result at the end of the day. Do Was there a question here in the front row before? I think we had the guy in the back row or wherever you want to go. Uh, my name is Kim Eskelsen. Uh, I want to change your perspective a little bit. I do share your pessimism. Politicians are like kids in their candy store. They're, well, out of reach. But isn't the, the, the thing to focus on the next crisis, I mean the next financial breakdowns, and the storytelling after the crisis, how do we get out of it? Because it's going to happen somewhere, somehow, soon, maybe later. But isn't that the, the way to focus? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but if you're, I think what you're asking, or at least I think the important way to answer it, I'll put it that way, is it matters a lot who wins the narrative. Uh, the Great Depression 
at least in the United States, was a giant failure of government. You had easy money policy from the Fed in the 1920s, and then all of a sudden you had the Smoot-Hawley tariff, then you had Hoover increasing government spending by 50% in four years, you had Hoover increasing the top tax rate from 25 to 63, it was like Holan before Holan was Holan. Uh, and so you had all these policies driving the economy into the, into the sewer, and then Roosevelt comes in, he's sort of like Obama following Bush, he does more of the same. Uh, tax rates go up to 79%, government spending doubles in eight years, uh, you have all these forms of government intervention, you're, you're paying farmers to kill pigs and pour milk in the sewers, and it, it's just, uh, it's an incredibly warped, destructive policy, uh, and you've had economists estimate that it extended the Great Depression by seven years, all the bad policy of Hoover and Roosevelt. But, but if you look at the history books, they still blame it on free markets. Uh, and, and all the way up until Reagan, uh, the memories of the Great Depression were, were I think, a very negative effect on, on getting good people elected. Uh, now, with the, with the case of the financial crisis, at least in the United States, I can't speak for other countries, at least in the United States, I think we've done a much better job fighting the narrative. So we don't have to worry about 50 years of mistaken impressions. And the, well, the history, the historians are left wing in America, so we'll probably still have bad history books saying, oh, it was the fault of greed on Wall Street. Well, that's like saying airplane crashes are the fault of gravity. <laughs> Doesn't say why the plane fell out of the sky. Weren't people in Wall Street greedy in the 1990s? Weren't they greedy in the 1980s? You know, every, you know people on Wall Street are greedy. We're all greedy. We all want more of whatever makes us happy. Uh, so greed isn't an explanation for financial crisis any more than gravity is for airplane crashes. Uh, but the good news is that at least among a substantial part of the policymaking community, I think we've done a good job saying this was the Fed with its foot on the gas on easy money policy combined with the government created entities of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac combined with things like the Community Reinvestment Act and all this other crap. Uh, and you know, so. I, don't, I would be exaggerating to say that we've won the narrative battle, but I think we've, uh, we've at least held our own in the fight. And um, now what does that say about the next crisis that happens? Um, I don't know, w w one narrative that we've definitely won uh, is we won this narrative, at least in the US. The, the, what happened in Greece and Italy and Spain and Ireland and all those countries, I do debates with, with the left-wing equivalents of me all the time. They have no answer, no response. Because they, they know you can, I mean, they raised every tax you can in these countries, it hasn't worked. So, so, so yeah, the, I agree with you, narratives are important, and I think we're doing a much better job today than we did in the 1930s with them. Any final questions? One? Okay, last question, so it has to be a good one. A lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering if you could elaborate on uh, how uh, Obamacare is unraveling, just short, maybe. I'm just curious. Um, well, it's unraveling politically because Obama made a series of very bold, rather silly promises. The average health care premium would drop by $2,500. Nobody would lose their health care plan. Nobody would have to change their doctor. All three of those things are now preposterously, laughably inaccurate. And Politico, or PolitiFact, PolitiFact, which is a left-wing, you know, left-leaning organization, had to rate, you can keep your health plan if you like your health plan, had to rate that the lie of the year. And almost certainly when the lie of the year is done for 2014, it's gonna be if you wanna keep your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Not to mention the fact that premiums are up, people are having their policies canceled. I mean, and in some sense, it's even worse for Obama than it should be. Because it's very funny, and I guess the answer to your question, I was pointing out, we went from a 68% government-controlled healthcare system to a 79%. Before Obamacare, everyone thought we had a free market. So every bad thing that happened in the healthcare system, like the rising prices, oh, that's the fault of the free market. No, it wasn't, but it got blamed on the free market. Now, Obama has moved the ball a little bit in the wrong direction, but now everything bad that happens is getting blamed on Obamacare, it, including things that were gonna happen bad before Obamacare was gonna pass. So Obama has the worst of all worlds. He made all sorts of explicit promises that are now just blowing up in his face. It's like you're lighting a stick of dynamite, you're gonna throw it, where am I gonna, boom! I mean, he's just, he's just getting, I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a the, the Democrats are like the, 
zombies in a, in a horror movie. They're so staggering around. They don't know what to do. Uh, and, 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 it's, and as I said, they're getting blamed even for things that aren't Obamacare's fault. Uh, so what does all that mean? Uh, I don't know. You talk to some real true believers on the left, they say, oh, see, we should have just done single payer. And you know what? If you do single payer like the UK or Canada and you start rationing care and, and, uh, and you know, you know, forcing doctors pay down and nurses pay down so you get you know, lower quality uh, people taking care of you and you can pay a lot less for health care. I mean, I think your question, well, yeah, we, we pay a lot and don't get better results. Now, if you have, if you have a very serious disease, people still come to America because our top quality medicine still tends to be some of the best in the world. But in general, you're right. We pay twice as much as a share of GDP. And don't forget, our GDP per capita is a lot higher than most places. And our overall results don't really, you know, we're not getting anything for it. But I think it's all, that's where you come to the third party payer. You know, again, remember what I said. If all you guys are going out with 89% of your dinner tonight paid for by me and the restaurants know it ahead of time, What's, what are they going to charge? They're going to charge a lot more. Uh, and that's what our healthcare system resembles in America. So, so I don't know whether the net result of all this is that we go to single payer, which I don't think will be a good idea. I don't know if the net result means that we somehow have this glorious opening to, to try to restore free markets. That's, you know, I'm pessimistic about that just because it's such a multi-pronged thing where you have to do all sorts of things at once. I, you know, so I don't know. It's a good question to end on because I'm stumped. So. So thank you very much for uh, coming.